Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carlo Flores, and I am the CHCI BP Public Policy Fellow. I'm delighted to be here with you today for this Building Digital Wealth breakout session. As we have national conversations about building generational wealth and looking at newer investment vehicles like cryptocurrency, non-fungible tokens or NFTs, and digital wallets or investment platforms, we must also talk about how Latinos can participate in this emerging sector and how we can educate and make these opportunities more accessible. That's why I am so excited to be here for this panel today. On behalf of CHCI, I would like to speak for uh, the chair of this panel, Representative Richie Torres, who unfortunately won't be able to join us today. In 2013, at the age of 25, Congressman Richie Torres became New York City's youngest elected official and the first openly LGBTQ person elected to office in the Bronx. At the city council, Representative Torres stood out, and during his seven-year tenure, he tenaciously tackled problems big and small for the Bronx and New York City. He passed over 40 pieces of legislation, including legislation protecting the city's affordable housing stock and tackling the city's opioid epidemic. Representative Torres currently serves as a member of the Committee on Financial Services and serves as the vice chair of the Committee on Homeland Security. I'd like to thank Representative Torres for all of his insights and efforts to building digital wealth in the Latino community. Now, I'm delighted to introduce Sylvia Foster Frau as our moderator for the session. Sylvia Foster Frau is a reporter for the Washington Post, where she writes about the nation's emergence as a predominantly multicultural society, exploring our changing racial, ethnic, and cultural demographics, and telling the stories of everyday people affected by and part of these changes. Please welcome our moderator, Sylvia Foster Frau. Thank you all so much for joining us for this conversation. Thank you, Carlo, for the introduction and to our three speakers who will introduce themselves um, shortly. Um, so the way Americans have been using money and currency is changing and it's changing quickly. Digital forms of currency, which were once kind of relegated to techies and the elite is now trickling down and trickling outwards towards celebrities, elected officials, and increasingly what we're going to talk about is the black and brown community. And so this is an exciting space, right? A lot of folks are excited about an opportunity to build wealth for these communities, but it's also um, relatively new and a lot of experts um, are un uneasy about what it can mean for these groups. And so we have here these panelists who are gonna kind of help speak to that. Um, I'm supposed to let y'all know that the hashtag is CHCI Summit. And um, if you have any questions, we will take questions and answers um, at the end. Um, so first, if y'all could just kind of go down the line and introduce yourselves for about a minute. Hi, uh, I'm Jonathan Padilla. I'm the CEO and co-founder of SneakerDuel Labs. SneakerDuel is focused on NFT data infrastructure. Uh, my career spans in blockchain about five years. I was the global head of blockchain strategy at PayPal, launching several products, designing PayPal stablecoin, and dealing with regulators uh, here in Washington on behalf of a large corporate entity. Additionally, uh, co-founded and led the Stanford Future of Digital Currency Initiative, which is a joint Stanford United Nations research lab. And uh, my first career was in government. I've run campaigns from the federal, state, and local, and a proud member of the board of the Hispanic Heritage Foundation for the last three years, and, and believe super strongly in all the work that young Latinos are doing here in rooms like this. Hi, I'm Clev Mesador. I'm the executive director of the Blockchain Foundation. I am also an advisor to the Blockchain Association, the largest advocacy group for the industry in Washington. The Blockchain Association represents over 90 companies in the industry. I've been working in this space for about six years. Previously, I worked in Congress for two members, as well as serving in the Obama administration. I was a presidential appointee at the Department of Commerce. I'm, I am an advocate for diversity, equity, inclusion in the blockchain and cryptocurrency space, and I am a huge advocate of women in this space and love the fact that women dominate this room, so. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Bill Rockwood. Um, first, I have to thank CHCI for the invitation and give a shout out to my colleague, uh, <laughs> Daniel Jones, who's a CHCI fellow who's in our office. You all are a great program and, and are well represented with the multiple fellows we've had. 
Um, but my name is Bill Rockwood. I uh, wear two hats. Um, I'm the executive director of a group called the Future Forum, which is a group of young Democratic members of Congress under the age of 50 that broadly advocate for um, youth engagement and issues around youth inclusion, uh, which this is a huge part. I'm also the deputy legislative director for Congressman Darren Soto, who is the co-chair of the Blockchain Caucus. And, and just for this particular context, we've introduced 13 bills uh, in this space. We passed the first blockchain bill out of the House. We passed the first digital asset bills out of the House. And we're really um, one of the first Dems on the issue. And we're really hoping to grow um, the narrative and the inclusiveness part because I'm so passionate because I do believe this is going to be the most democratizing yeah. Um, technology of our lifetime. So I have a huge personal passion and, and hope we can continue to grow the, this narrative and um, inclusiveness. Yeah, so you mentioned, you know, words like inclusiveness and democratization. And I wanted to start first with what is kind of the state of Latinos right now in the traditional banking system that we have? Like, how are folks being excluded? How are inequities playing out for the community? Maybe, Clive, do you want to take it? Or? Yeah, I'll start. I think, you know, we know that the numbers are terrible for Black and Latino communities, right, in terms of traditional finance and also in terms of access to traditional banking. And that's one of the reasons the fintech space actually evolved, right, because fintechs recognized that Black and Latino communities had to create alternative financial systems outside of banking for a long time and sought to seize on that. Right, so, you know, I, I love the commercials for Chime where you can deposit your, uh, your paycheck there and also get a loan there. And, you know, but it also tells you where we're at in terms of, you know, needing to close the gap for black and Latino communities. And so, so as those numbers for traditional finance and even, you know, the fintechs move the needle, but hasn't really closed the, the gap. And I think that's where we see an opportunity with blockchain technology. I always tell people that think of blockchain like avocado toast. I, I, I was born in Haiti. My family is from the Caribbean. I remember in Haiti, that's what's poor people's food, right? Avocado and bread was, if you actually had meat. And today in, in the US, we've made it something cost $50 to get. So <laughs> like, crypto has really just, really standardized a lot of the non-traditional systems we know about, like cooperatives, right? You know, lending person to person versus to a banking. So it sounds very spooky to people, but we, we, we have to make sure people have options, and that's what has led to a lot of the gaps we've seen is the fact that we don't have a lot of options for our communities, and we, we are at a point where we need to make sure every individual has as many access as possible, because that's the only way money becomes inclusive. I know you wanted to add yeah, something. Yeah, and I'll just frame it with two statistics, that currently one third of the Latino community is either unbanked or underbanked. And I think the numbers are comparable or even slightly worse within the African American community. And if you look historically, there are blatant examples of exclusion, things like redlining and the whole gener generational wealth transfer. There's some really um, powerful effects that, that get down. And um, I think the traditional banking system was intentionally exclusionary. And um, you know, the other statistic I'll throw out there is I think there was a moment with the dot-com boom and the emergence of the internet where there was a democratizing potential. But if you look at it, it's, it's several large companies. 81% of uh, computer programmers are white male. So I think even that was a bit of a missed moment where uh, you know, it's a huge access issue that not only is crypto and blockchain already more inclusive than both of these, um, these historical wealth creators, but it's also a bit of a paradigm shift where the banks generated the wealth and generated the loans and decided who has access. I think the dot coms are almost or the big, big tech companies are almost the new gatekeepers. Yeah. And I think there is a bit of a shift where um, creators can own their own creation or you know, cryptocurrency or an individual in rural Africa can have access to 
you know, micro loans through crypto lending. It, it really does have the potential to be a game changer and um, kind of in, address uh, some of the historical injustices, but also empower people. I think that's what we're really after, and I, I think it could be a great tool for that. And I do want to piggyback off of one thing to say additionally on that, right? So, you know, we know that globally 1.7 billion people are unbanked, underbanked, and lack access to traditional finance. And we know in the US that number is estimated between 65 to 70 million people. Like, so I actually intentionally did not use that number because you know, there's this whole you know, misconception that it's the unbanked, right? That's who has been left behind by traditional finance. And it's really not. Yes, it is the unbanked, but it's professionals like myself who have advanced degrees, who are Gen Xers, who, despite how much degrees I have or money I have, banks will still not give me this access to the same financial instruments or loans as my contemporaries. It's our, it's our small businesses. It's, it's our nonprofit organizations. You know, there's, I, I always use this, you know, so I'm a broken record, but black churches, Latino churches, deposit lots sums of money into banks, the same banks that won't give them a loan. So there is this misconception that, you know, you're, you're educated, so you're not being redlined, you're not getting subprime mortgages, when it's the, when it's the reverse. So it is, so many people have been left behind and continue to be, regardless of doing everything society expected and told you that was the credentials to actually be able to have that access. Yeah, so you have this kind of whole system in place that is working against folks in different ways, at different levels, from different walks of life. And um, then, then crypto comes about. And so I'm wondering, I imagine there are probably folks here that use crypto, but there are also probably people who are just like crypto curious, as they say, and are hearing about it, but don't really know what it is. So I'm wondering if one of y'all just wants to try to describe in layman's terms, kind of what is cryptocurrency and what are we talking about when you're saying fintech um, and blockchain? Yeah, so we think about crypto, the simplest way to think about this is it is a mathematical proof that is used to secure safely data. That's, that's all crypto, it's cryptography, and now there's an economic incentive model behind that. When most people think about crypto, they conflate blockchain and crypto. They're actually two different things. You can have a blockchain-based system that basically leverages decentralization, but doesn't have the cryptocurrency that's designed to incentivize people to validate that network. Uh, when other thing is people typically conflate Bitcoin with crypto and blockchain, and that's there's a whole other thing. Think about Bitcoin as, at this point, digital gold that is not governed or regulated by a state centralized actor, and is instead a community of folks who validate by proving math problems with supercomputers. That's literally all Bitcoin is. And it's a way to, because there's a finite supply, to have scarcity. That's a nice hedge against things like inflation, which, lo and behold, uh, is problematic today. It kind of seems like the 1970s again. But um, yeah, I mean, just to quickly piggyback, I think we think about services and how this impacts industry. I mean, I'm going to say something that might be controversial. Fear is a powerful motivator. And it's nice when large financial actors who have vested interest in regulation are afraid. The banks are existentially afraid of the power of crypto. And even if everyone isn't using Bitcoin or a stable coin or some sort of asset, this is putting the fear of God into large boardrooms from JP Morgan to Goldman Sachs to Citibank to Bank of America. And it's going to force them to have a revolutionary improvement in service delivery to basically keep pace. And I think that's good. I mean, that's good for the consumer. It's good for people in marginalized communities. And I would say, thinking about this space, we're at the, the best way to think about this is, if we look at Bretton Woods following the conclusion of the Second World War, you're looking at both an economic reordering of the world akin to Bretton Woods with the creation of the internet. And you're having that basically be merged together in a tenth of the time. And that's the kind of blockchain revolution we're in right now. And I actually have a, a quick definition that actually falls in line with exactly what you just said. You know, I tell people, I start with the technology, right? I said blockchain technology is, you know, blockchain is technology that securely verifies information, facilitates the exchange of value with our third parties. And if we go through that again, you know, it's technology that securely verifies information. That's the ledger you hear about. 
facilitates the exchange of value, that's cryptocurrencies, with our third parties, that's decentralization. And then going back to this thing about the cryptocurrency versus the, the technology, think of this light that is beautiful and bright, right? What powers the light is electricity. So think of Bitcoin, electricity, and Ethereum, like the light, right? What powers them is blockchain, right? The various blockchains, right? But, but, but that in itself is interesting, right? It's, it's what is powering it. But what's even more interesting is, imagine if all we did with electricity was just light. What a waste would that be? Imagine all of the things we do with electricity that we don't even know about. That is the potential of the technology, right? Cryptocurrency is just this one thing, and there are so many other asp applications and protocols and ways that we can be leveraging it. And I'll jump in and add one more. And I, I should have said to start this off that uh, my views do not necessarily <laughs> reflect that of Congressman Soto or, or the Future Forum. So apply that to what I already said. It was potentially a little spicy. So, um, so just to add another analogy here to kind of, um, for the crypto curious, do not be intimidated. Uh, you know, a lot of these, the terminology, a lot of people get caught up and they, they give up. So just the ideas are the most important um, part. So when we talk about crypto or blockchain, uh, this, this is the imaginary phone, if that wasn't clear. <laughs> um, but I, I think everyone knows Venmo or Cash App, that right now you know, you're able to transfer value from one to the other. But if Venmo crashed, you no longer have access to that network. It's unclear what would happen to that money. Um, whether it's even your money to begin with if it, Venmo went out of business. So that's why they, a lot of times they encourage you not to keep money there. Um, so it's very dependent on the in-house network. It's one server farm that is powered by one corporation to allow everyone to have access, whereas crypto and blockchain instead, you're not just relying on one company. It's actually the same access to money or information or whatever it is but say it's, it's powered by a, a million different computers across the world, or your, your phone has a little bit of bandwidth in the background that doesn't get used. So when we're talking about multiple point ver verification, when you're one company with one um, singular network, you have total control. But if you're using it from multiple validators, you have to formulate some terms of like, this is the standard of agreement. So just think of it as like Venmo with Thousand, millions of nodes that confirm that, hey, even though it's across a large network on a bunch of different devices, we all agree on what it's saying. The money part is crypto. I transfer money. The informational part and the actual network I'm describing of the different validators, that's what blockchain is. It's the underlying part that allows the uh, money facilitation. So how are folks mostly using crypto then? And why is it that, what characteristics about it makes it such, um, what you argue is such an opportunity for democratization and for gaining wealth? Well, to be super candid, a lot of crypto stuff doesn't work right now. I'm just gonna be very honest. Um, the fees associated with sending money on Ethereum or other kind of L2 solutions, what's your networks that improve the efficiency of some of these bigger chains, uh, they're just, they don't, they don't really work. They're not really ready to scale. The technology is being built out to the point in the next three to five years, a cost of transaction may be a penny or two. But right now, if you're using Ethereum, which is the kind of main utility network, you're going to spend $50 to send, you know, $5. And it's not really feasible for average consumers. Now, the potential of the technology is actually really, really fascinating, though. If we look at how this thing is being built out, uh, Cleve talked about peer-to-peer you know, -peer networks and, and those types of payments. You're now able to kind of settle things and have basically many bank accounts in the form of your digital wallet, could be, which could be housed in your phone. And the practicality of that becoming a means to store real value to get yield and, and have you know, real interest of maybe 2 3% in a safe way, that is probably about half a decade out. But... Uh, Right now, somebody who put right back, I mean, I put crypto on Venmo. That was my team. Uh, you know, know Venmo is a more efficient system right now. But I do think if we look at the, the prog progress of the technology, having this type of system that will put pressure on existing payment rails for both speed and cost of transaction, uh, this is inevitably going to be a game changer for how people do low-cost 
cross-border payments, uh, and a whole host of other activities. And, and in terms of that utility and how people are using it, I do think that one of the most revolutionary part of this thing is all you need, what, the starting point is that mobile phone, right? And what have we done over the last few decades is all over the world and the most remote parts of the world, we've gotten a mobile phone in front of people. And I think that's one of the reasons you're seeing adaption across the continent of Africa, across Latin America and the Caribbean. Even in America, the largest adaption is among black and Latino people is because you know that entry point is important to us and we're using it as an access point, right? So if you just need that mobile phone as a, as, as a starting point, I remember being in Haiti in my w- remote Room, mountain area, like literally, you, it's two hours up a mountain, and then when you get there, there's nothing to do. But I remember going for Christmas, and there was a man on a donkey. He was literally just on a phone, and I asked him, who was he on the phone with? It was his cousin in Germany. <laughs> right? So imagine if his cousin in Germany could send him money using maybe the Bitcoin Lightning Network, or whatever, it, or maybe a stable coin platform where they could instantly send him money. Because right now, the way to send the money is using like some Western Union or something where it will take 25% fees. We know remittances because black and Latino communities, we send money back home and we experience this. But then he'll have to go to wherever the local Western Union place is, get that money, and then come out with people knowing he has the money and potentially get robbed. Right? There's so many access points. Don't even start with the female street vendors across the Caribbean and Latin America that have this. The worst thing you could do is be successful and actually make money. So I, there are a few ut- ways that we're, I think the reason why we're early adapters is because utility for us is just so varied, right? It is really about access to a new financial asset class that we would have never been the first to access before. And the fact that you didn't need a a bank account, and then you can actually easily purchase that. That is attractive. But also, you know, and when we did our prep call, I loved what you said, which I agree with, you know. For so many people, we focus on privacy, right? It's really ownership for us, right? It's really this opportunity to actually not just be consumers and owners, and then also leverage the technology to solve inequity to the problems that we've seen, you know, and that runs the gamut. There's a, there's, there's a project called Popcom by Dawn Dixon where she's actually just, you know, she's just innovating vending machines. You know, you can buy Louis Vuitton shoes and then more cannabis, but federally regulated products like cannabis requires for you to actually verify identity. That was her pain point. She wasn't a crypto person. They just looked for how do you verify identity? What is the best way to do that at a vending machine, at a you know, at the point of purchase? And they felt that blockchain just solved that. So they used the technology. No fuss, no muss, right? It was just using it as a technology, as a solution to a problem. And then, you know, for, for when, when you think of COVID, right, remember the stimulus checks? Right? They, they were there supposed to go to the most vulnerable in rural communities and urban communities. Well, those people were the last ones to get it because the U.S. government doesn't have a, a digital cash system to get to the most remote places. And our communities, they actually don't, there is no credit card on file or direct deposit information on file. They actually still get paper checks. I still have family members I have to send them money orders because all cash in the mail because otherwise they would not cash it. So how can we actually get to those people? You know, so when you think about this thing about payments, right, for us, it's really just that basic. We need to just get money in the hands of people, not just back home, but just here so that they don't have to go to the cash checking place, right? They don't have to get on the bus to go to the bank, right? They don't have to experience what Ryan Kugler, the the director of Black Panther just experienced, he went to the bank last month to cash a check and the teller called the cops on him and because he didn't look like he belonged there. So for a lot of our communities, right, the going to the bank is, do I look okay? All these. So when you look at adaption, right, there are lots of people who think about in, using as a CBDC, a security versus a commodity. For our communities, it's really about basic needs and basic utilities that will actually get us to be able to participate and potentially become owners. The CBDC is a central bank digital currency, which is just a <laughs> stable coin issued by a national government. Again, don't be uh, intimidated by the acronyms. Um, it's the, the concepts that really... Yeah. So let's just 
again, these are, are very similar points, and I'll just state it in a slightly different way. When, we, um, when Clev says 1.7 billion people are unbanked, what does that mean? It means you literally do not have access to a traditional financial system. Um, and actually, some of the most exciting product, uh, projects in this space right now are happening in Africa and Latin America because they're literally known as um, leapfrog technologies. If I'm in um, you know, rural Latin America somewhere and I, I can't, I don't have a bank account um, or I don't trust the bank, that's also a big thing. Or with the stimulus check, if I don't have a street address, I'm not getting my check. And there were proposals to give prepaid debit, debit cards but there was a paternalistic fear of doing that. So it's, I think a more viable thing would be, again, um, you know, invisible phone. A lot more people have access to smartphones. Whereas if you're going the traditional route um, to community build, you, you would need to develop a telecom infrastructure. You need uh, banks willing to invest to have boots on the ground. You know, if, you're applying from some other country, you're bottom of the stack on what they're considering because of the risk. Um, but if you literally have a phone, a smartphone and an internet connection, you have access to these networks. And that's why these are leapfrog technologies. And on the innovation front, a lot of the most, uh, most creative solutions are from people from communities that didn't have access. They were the ones that were encountering the difficulty, so they're the ones with the creative solutions for how to get out of them. Um, so, you know, there's I, a lot of, one of the most powerful stories I heard was a, um, a Haitian uh, creator that took a, a $500 student loan that she went to take a coding class, and then, you know, uh, remitten, remittances. What does that term mean? It's to send money across a border um, and then it's, it's exchanged into a different currency, US to Haiti. And a lot of times there's a 25 plus per percent fee associated with that, um, which is just untenable. Or the, this migrant seasonal worker who comes here, works for six months, wants to send money back to their family, if they're hit with a 25% upcharge every time they do that, they are immediately kneecapped in that. So there just has to be a more efficient way these solutions help reduce some of those barriers to um, traditional access, but they also allow for innovation and uh, to fill the gaps that the traditional system is currently not addressing at this point. Yeah. I want to um, kind of pivot just really briefly to talk about NFTs. I'm wondering if y'all can kind of describe them and, and explain how or if these fit into um, you know, this whole topic of being able to gain wealth in a digital space? Yeah, um, a non-fungible token or NFT, the simplest way to think about this is if you have Legos, this is a content Lego. You can construct it by various things. It might be a JPEG of a piece of art, but it could also be music, a receipt, a ticket, a coupon, anything that is individual, unique, uh, that, that can really be formed into an NFT. It's secured on chain, which means that the provenance and ownership of that asset can be verified from the point of generation. If you're going to resell it or whatnot, um, you can have that whole chain of custody. NFTs, I mean, I think it really depends uh, on how we look at the paradigm shift of the technology. Most of the NFTs that are out to market are frankly going to go to zero. Nobody's going to pay $10,000 for a JPEG unless it's some sort of prominent artist. Let's just be kind of real about this. That being said, you know, there's been a lot of people who made money kind of flipping NFTs. I think you're gonna, they're going to have a bubble. I mean, we're already looking at macro, a challenged crypto market if we see this stuff from last week. But this is where the technology class becomes really interesting if we're looking about how this will build the capacity for wealth creation. And what I mean by that is, Credentialing, ID, the types of things that make somebody's uh, ability to get a job and to verify their, their skills, that, that that's a truly powerful thing. Imagine if you're a service worker and you've now been trained you know, as a waiter or whatever it might be, having that kind of portable credential to let you have ease of movement across different jobs. If we're looking at verification, so for credit or other types of assets, that becomes incredibly powerful to have something that can have instantaneous verification and access to now massive capital markets. 
And as we think about, frankly, you know, how government services are, are offered, you know, we've brought up CBDC, central bank digital currency, the interplay of digital assets like that, that you can now apply scalpel-like precision to government programs and services based on the types of NFTs that qualify you as an individual. Are you going to be you know, verifiably ready for, for Medicare or Medicaid? Or are you going to get something from, from CANF? These types of programs that can be quite easily sliced and diced and move away from the arcane systems we have running government bureaucracy right now. That, to me, is a far more realistic and plausible path that will transfer wealth and get the resources needed to empower communities than maybe some of this art creator economy stuff, but just, just my opinions. <laughs> well, I, I, do th I look at NFTs not from the crypto lens, because I actually think we don't deserve the credit for NFTs. The, I think creators for decades have had this real pain point, right? And especially creators of color. They weren't able to first protect their intellectual property, then monetize it, then create a marketplace to profit. Think of all of the graffiti artists, right, whose arts, they, got, they probably got arrested for it, but somebody put it in a book and made millions from it. Might think of all of the musicians in our communities who struggle getting their royalties or who never got credit for any of the works that they did. You know? So we, creative economies are very central to you know, a lot of our cultures, right? But creative economies are very critical to the US economy. When you look at the whole smart cities conversation, cities for the last decade have been looking at creative industries to really grow their economies. And that means we have to create opportunities for the creator to be able to build wealth through their, <clears throat> through their art, whatever that art is. So for me, crypto is not the success story here. The success story is the, the creators that had had this pain point finally found a solution that solved their problem. It was never about us, right? They just found a tool that says, Great, so now before I put it out there, I can protect my intellectual property, and now I can monetize it, and I could create a marketplace to get money from it, and go even further and say, okay, you know what? I'm gonna digitize this art. I'm gonna put it in so that if you buy it, right, I get paid, but I'm also gonna put in a small contract that if you sell it to her, I also get paid. I can even put it that if you sell it then, right, because the secondary and the, the, the other markets, that's where a lot of artists get, get screwed as well, right? So that's been one of the value to them. And then to make it all, to, to, on top of it all, they didn't just get an opportunity to make more money because creators have made more money leveraging this new tool than they have in decades. Now they learned a new skill set. Just the whole process of learning MetaMask requires for you to, it's like learning, learning Excel back in the day. So now they have a new skill set to even be able to take their art to the next level and even not compete in the innovation economy. So for me, that's the vantage point that I look at it. It is that we solved the problem. It wasn't us. It was just a tool. That's all it was. And our communities benefited from it. Yeah, and um, again, don't take a lot of what we're saying as direct financial advice. I think it is a very <laughs> volatile market. I do agree that there was a bit of, there is a bubble with NFTs, but I, I think even when it pops, there are still going to be some valuable projects, but the lesson isn't about the, the spike or the chasing of this or that crypto project. Like, you, you need to be incredibly careful. Like, for, first and foremost, a lot of scams out there, if it is too good to be true, do some more research. Um, so let's just state that, because um, there are people with entrenched interests that are still, you know, trying to scam people out there. But the idea of NFTs, it's art on a blockchain. Um, so I create something, I can, you know, turn it into a uh, NFT, and then I have direct access to a consumer. So what that means is I can sell it either directly to you know, a, um, a, a network that sells them, or I can sell them directly cons to consumers myself. So you've removed, you know, if we're talking about a music artist, they have publishers and the label and you know, the, the parent company and this and that. And even if you are pirated or your copyright are stolen, your intellectual property, you still have to go sit in court for uh, several years, and you probably won't 
ever see the benefit because people will have forgotten that by the yeah. time it gets through the court. Um, I was watching a documentary about Elvis the other day, and there was a, a lot of, um, you know, 60 years after the fact, a lot of folks are realizing that Elvis was just a white guy that stole a lot of black music, and he was the one, I shouldn't say stole, that used cultural influences to uh, bring music from different communities to a white audience. And he captured all of the economic benefit where you can trace specific songs back to black Latino artists. And, um, you know, he was the revolutionary, but a lot of times his influence was from marginalized community. So that took 60 years for that narrative to even get out. Um, I think a lot of people won't even know that now, and I probably should have phrased it a little differently. But I think it's just... Uh, a luminary of like when I have a uh, NFT, I'm the creator. There is a direct proof on my my phone that I created it. Even if you take a screenshot, I can say no. I have the source code. This is mine. That's cute. What you have. Uh, so it's really just art. Like what that's worth is highly debatable. But I think there is a lot of intrinsic value to the artist and the person to own it because they can 100% say this is the original genuine article. And maybe it won't be art, but there will be things down the road that the same concept will be applied to and be incredibly valuable. I mean, just really quickly, like art is where NFTs are now. Like no debating that. I think saying that NFTs aren't actually like lessens the technology. It's really on these other advanced enterprise applications that will be transformative. And I think that's looking where the value will be unlocked. That is going to be the multi-trillion dollar opportunity, way more valuable than the art space. It's just where we are now and where we're going, kind of directionality. And there's a woman, Beatriz Ramos, she runs Data. Data is is an NFT community for, for artists globally. And she actually, her community actually created NFTs way before Dapper Labs. But for them, they did not go into that direction because she's really focused on creating a community. So I definitely recommend looking at Data is by Beatriz Ramos, and she is just doing incredible stuff in terms of creating a community. And the goal is really to create opportunity for artists, less about creating, you know, millions of money for just because just to create a market for the sake of creating a market. Yeah. So I want to get into a little bit about the risks and concerns with cryptocurrency and about where regulation stands with it. So. Um, there's you know, a lot of debate even of how to classify cryptocurrency and what agency should be regulating it. And I wanted to know, you know where that stands right now and also what your thoughts are to folks who say, hey, you know, it, it, it's been a long time coming to get consumer protections even in the traditional financial system. We really need to get more consumer protections. You, know, you mentioned some of the scam companies that are out there that folks could be vulnerable to, you know, what what needs to be done on that front to protect consumers who are entering this relatively new space? I mean, I'll go quickly. I mean, I've put my Stanford hat on. I mean, we've been looking at this for a long time on a cross uh, transnational basis. Like, first, the U.S. should look to what's happening in Switzerland, Tel Aviv, and Singapore for guidance, and I think what are good policies. The simplest things are having definitions. You have various types of cryptocurrency. You have Bitcoin, which is store of value, stable coins for forms of payments. You have utility tokens, which are really things like Ethereum that are future utilization of networks. And you have security tokens, which should be regulated by the SEC. So there's a whole host of like figuring out definitions and then frankly getting policymakers in a spot where we can understand where the tech is going. Look at the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority out of the UK in London. They've had a FinTech sandbox designed to structure and figure out best practices because their notion is we're just too nascent to figure out hardline regulations, which could have a stifling impact. And the last thing I'll say, I know you have some thoughts here, is like we have an opportunity. China had really stringent regulations. China is frankly leading the U.S. on digital assets, both innovation and human capital. We have a unique spot that we can get regulation right to frankly keep the U.S. as a leader in this space because right now we are falling far behind. And I'll just mention the, the critical nature of the balance of getting this right. I think a lot of people use the word or the term Web 3.0. Um, and Web 2.0 or your you know, traditional, I use a username and password, you have all my data, you make a lot of money selling my information for third-party ads. 
Uh, so I think we did see in the creation of the internet, it's like, just leave it alone totally. It'll sort itself out. And I think that was important for the initial growth and adoption, but we're literally at the point where complete unregulation has kind of created some um, concerns that are just becoming apparent. So if you look back, there probably were points that we could have been a little more proactive, but if you overregulate um, for innovation, you drive a lot of uh, the stuff overseas. Like right now, some startups are spending up to 50% of their startup costs on legal compliance because they don't know who the regulator is. So even just saying who the regulator is, it's probably going to be some combination of the SEC, the CFTC, and the FTC. Just knowing who the regulator is it keeps um, innovation here domestically, which is critically important. But it also allows you to bake in some consumer protections in a way that you can get in front of it so that it's not like, oh, the system blew up. Like, we missed, we should have done more. Like, that's sort of the balance we're trying to, to find. And really quickly, consumer protection, the riskiest place for black and Latino people is the traditional financial system. That's where we've gotten the most food, and that's where we face the least amount of consumer protections. That said, consumer protectionism, in the way that Washington talks about it, to me, equates to patriarchy, right? We, we have agency. We can make decisions. We can take risks and take pragmatic risks. What we need Washington to, talk, to start talking about is consumer empowerment, right? Because empowerment is a conversation about how are they investing in financial literacy? How are they investing in skills training? How are they increasing access to capital to entrepreneurs, right? The burden is on them, right? Enough with this. They have to save us from ourselves. We need them to invest in empowerment. And we do have to turn to Q&A, um, but I did want to get really quickly a chance to talk about um, the importance of education, if maybe just one of y'all can say really quickly. Um... Education is critical. Uh, I'm a CEO. I need to hire folks. It's really hard to find engineers for people of color, and I pay a premium to my recruiters to try to find those folks. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff we can do on this front, and the foundations from a lot of these blockchain companies are willing to invest in in basically training, but we have to make it front and center. Uh, Hispanic Heritage Foundation, a proud board member there, we've been doing a lot of charlas with, with Google and other big fintech companies trying to get more Hispanic engineers. We need to do more of that. We need to expand it. We need to scale it and get these folks jobs. We need to invest more in education. Uh, the, the, the Black Chain Foundation I work for, well, I'm the executive director of, is financial literacy focused because we need to arm people with trusted content, and right now the public is scrambling where to get information, so we need to create places where the industry can provide content and everyone has a one-stop shop. So a lot more work to do, but we need more education. Spanish language content, all yes. of that. Yeah. Okay, we have to move to questions. Um, I guess we're, are we just raising hands? Is that what we're doing? All right. And Carla will come around with the mic. I have a question. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Just kidding. So, um, kind of going back to education, um, thinking about this is, you know, I kind of understand it a little bit, but I think back at like in black and brown communities, you know, other like my parents, you know, aunts, uncles, all that, they're very mistrustful of the traditional economic system already, and they're also not very confident when it comes to technological, you know. They're not technologically literate. So what do you think can be done from, like, on your end and from other, you know, companies' ends? Like, we talked about education and trying to be bilingual and being able to get down to the roots. But what else can be done in this space to give them the confidence to say, okay, you know what, instead of putting the money still, you know, my parents still put it in their uh, mattress, like, I'm confident enough to go get a phone and get, you jump into the system. What do you think has to happen for that? So... First off, like, it's a great question. I mean, I said this earlier, like, blockchain still kind of sucks. And I mean that in the nicest possible way. I mean, how many, this show event, how many people here have, like, used MetaMask or sent money using digital wallets? So very, very few. It, this is a stressful thing. I mean, if I'm stressed doing this, and I used to do this for a big corporation, I mean, our design hero at Sneakerdoodle is, is the blockchain grandma. If I can convince my abuela to use blockchain, I'm doing something right. And the reality is UX, UI, the consumer experience just needs to completely level up because the product that is out is one, it's not mobile friendly, it's not optimized for mobile, which excludes a lot of Latinos and people of color. 
And then two, it's just, it's just kind of janky. That's the best word to describe it. It's not consumer friendly. It's not, you don't feel confident sending, you know, $20, even if the costs are marginal. And I would say on education, I think the reason the data shows that Black and Latino communities need adoption in the U.S. is because Black and Latino innovators went into our communities and we did the education over the last decade. It wasn't because the industry targeted our community. So it's because we did it on small scales. One of the best projects I know of is Crypto in Context in the Bronx that was started Carlos Acevedo, who now works for Brave, but like six years ago, he was a teacher who worked with electric coin company in the Bronx Community College to actually go into a Latino community in the Bronx, do education in language and empower people. But in order to scale that, we need funding for that, right? And so that's the, the go back to the enough of that protection thing. How much of that funding goes into our community? Because we know the infrastructure bill has all of this money for, for digital literacy and stuff, but it goes to the same usual suspects and it never trickles down to our community. But what can the industry do? We absolutely should do more. For the foundation, one of the things we're, we're, we're going to be doing is creating a digital assets library where we invite everybody in the industry to actually aggregate content. It's going to be virtual. They've created trusted content they've sent to Washington, white papers, all of this stuff. We're going to work with the American Library Association to, to make sure it can be accessible. But we need one point of information where people know that this is not some weird YouTube video and is, who is this person. Also, one of the things in my work that I've done, I've, I've, I've done this education piece, I realize leaders of public institutions, leaders of nonprofits, leaders of, of academic institutions, they've been clear. They do not want to outsource the education of their network, of their stakeholders to us, right? They want to have these conversations, but they want to do it. So one of the things that we're looking at is where for the foundation, we're actually looking at Georgetown to actually create a two-day certification program for leaders of institutions so that they can do their engagement. Just so you know, when a member of Congress is elected, they don't send them to Washington. They don't trust them to send them to Washington, no matter how one, how much they won. They actually go to a two-week program at Harvard. Yeah, and the king runs the program. Yeah, and they have to learn how, how a bill becomes a law. So this is no different, but we'll actually have a certificate program at a trusted institution that they're comfortable with. They can do it in person or virtual, and where the industry is participating. What, what help do you need? So we have to recognize that this is happening, but we have to resource not just consumers, but leaders of institutions that want to start doing this because there's no one size fits all. And I would just say, uh, ask questions and be nice. Like, that's a big <laughs> problem with this ecosystem right yes. now is it's a lot of holier than thou. And, and I'm being thought-provoking intentionally. But um, no, it's true. you have to meet people where they are. Um, I think the messaging has been better to the, the right, candidly, because there's a lot of libertarian ethos uh, within the foundations of Bitcoin and some of these technologies. And it's literally just asking the questions, promoting narratives. I think that stuff really appeals um, to different audiences. The, our job is not to get grandma comfortable with using crypto. Like the real acceleration curve is going to be you using blockchain-based or crypto-based systems without you realizing it. Like you use a lot of these rails where you don't know how to code, but you can get on your, again, your little phone and it does a lot of magic things. So a lot of it's just integrating, building up the trust, being nice to people, and just really collaborative. I think that's where we need to work together, where folks really do recognize this potential. But there isn't going to be one politician. There's not going to be one regulator. There's not, you know, the Blockchain Association's great. So I think there does need to be a concentration of uh, educational resources. But also, I think the empowerment angle and going to edu uh, just really promoting the, the pipeline. It's going to be the people in this room that are the young creators that maybe yeah. grandma heard of that crazy thing called crypto, but it's really empowering this generation to be the next generation of um, entrepreneurs and creators. And I, I do want to add to just the reporter in me. You do have a panel of folks who are obviously, you know, encouraging of of cryptocurrency in the community, but just from my reporting, there are also folks who disagree with that, right? And who say that, um, you know, why would you expect this um, traditional financial system that has biases, why would you expect this new one to be any different unless there's like a really active kind of anti-bias movement? Or why would we want, you know, folks who are in 
um, one vulnerable system to jump to this other new, more volatile system. So I would really encourage also all of you to like do your own research, read as much as you can, you know, look at all the criticisms of it and the other, you know, maybe the Washington, read the Washington Post, <laughs> but really like read up on your own to decide for you if that's something you want to invest in and if so, like how much you want to put into that. Hi, uh, <clears throat> uh, my name is Daniel Jones. Uh, that was actually kind of a perfect segue into my question, right? Is how how do we do our own research in this, right? Because kind of like we mentioned, right, there's not really a an overseeing body. There aren't really like, there's not necessarily a course I can take that would educate me this necessarily as far as my understanding is. So like where are the places that I might look? Because it's hard to kind of just Google crypto, right? Or like blockchain that you get a billion different results, right? So where are places I can look to try and find some, you know, uh, uh, like real information, right, on, on both sides that help me round out that decision-making process? Generally, you should look for something from the universities. Um, they generally have higher quality content. Uh, reporting from things like Blockworks and Coindesk, you no know, offense to the post, have been really, I think, a step post. forward as they've <laughs> invested in, in crypto. But, but I'll, I'll be candid, like, this is very dangerous. Uh, on regulation, you know, if you think about insider trading and alpha and why we have the Securities Act, it's frankly because there are bad actors, and there are bad actors out there who unfortunately will try to take advantage of folks. Um, so, like, it is really kind of a buyer beware, and I think keeping close to looking at who, who the founders of the teams are, their track records, even that is a lot more important than something you read online in terms of a white paper or something like that. A lot of that's fraught, kind of a fraud at this point. I will say there are resources that you should you should access, right? I recommend that everybody read the white paper. It's available in like a hundred languages. It's on Bitcoin.com. It's the Bitcoin white paper. When you print it, it's about seven pages. Understand why this space was created. Understand this whole issue of solving for the double spend issue. Start there, and also there are some books you can read, right? I always recommend starting with The Internet of Money by Andreas Antonopoulos. It's just a series of articles and such. It just talks about how we've been digitizing money. And I think, you know, your point that just about any place you trust right now has an article about cryptocurrency. If you're an accountant, oh my God, if you're a dog walker, everybody had. So go to the places you trust already, whether it be your, your, your traditional newspaper or even, you know, or even you know, Latino publications. Start with where you trust and then build out. But I think it's important to start reading with the white paper and then going to places you trust and then looking at some books by places, by folks you, good authors. Yeah, and I would just say uh, balanced uh, pieces. You know, blockchain isn't going to cure cancer, but it, the things it can help with, it's going to help a lot. So I think if a piece acknowledges the potential benefits and also acknowledges what it won't solve for, like I think that's a piece that isn't communicated enough and that's why this stuff isn't believable sometimes. So just look for resources that, you know, are both communicate the benefits, but are also, um, you know, what it won't do. I, I think that's where a lot of things um, would be very helpful of like, hey, we're just focusing on the, these, these problems we're trying to solve. It's not going to be good at that. Um, that's generally an indication of, of good reporting that doesn't have a, a narrative cooked into it. So unfortunately, we're out of time for more questions. Um, panelists, is there any final words you want to impart on our audience before we go? I mean, I would say that this is going to be, as, as a space, probably the most important transformation of, I think, the global economy in the last 50 years, really since Bretton Woods. The United States has an opportunity to kind of, cur like, I guess, directionality steer how we do this, but it's going to require us to deep thinkly about the state of the global economy and how we regulate. And if we can do that, not only will this be tremendously powerful for minorities and people of color in the United States, but frankly, as a tool set to uplift billions of people globally from poverty. And there's a whole other stuff there, but directionality, we're in a good spot if we can get the regulation and the space safe. I think how you think about crypto is based on what is your relationship with money. I would be surprised if Warren Buffett came out and, and endorsed crypto, like crypto. The man has made so much money off of the digital financial system. If I was him, I'd be like, hell no. 
So if your if the traditional financial system has failed you, if you if your relationship money, with money is scarce and it's challenging, you look for options and you want options, right? So I do think look at that that lens from that look at crypto from that lens and look at utility from how we can help our communities, our families look look to other options. I think. No one can define for you what is the best approach, what you should be doing. But I do think that we have tools. FinTech was one of them. Crypto is, is another. There'll be you know, layers onto this. But I think we need to finally start looking at our relationship with money and how we can actually make some tr transformative changes. Yeah, and I would, uh, one starting place, if you're curious, keep asking questions. Don't be yeah. intimidated. If the paper's too technical, don't force your way through it. Look yeah. for more accessible things and work into that. Because I see a lot of people that get scared off because they're intimidated. I think it is going to be a social empowerment thing. I think, you know, up to a, a tenth plus of the global economy is going to be based in this stuff one way or another in the next 10 to 20 years. So it's a huge opportunity, but your skepticism, keep it. Um, keep asking questions. You know, if anyone's dismissive, don't keep going to that person to ask them questions. Find somebody you can bounce ideas off of. Know what problems you're trying to solve for. You know, when we frame conversations this way, it's like we're moving to this stuff because there have been problems with the way things have been done before. It's not a, pro a solution in search of a problem. Um, so just keep asking questions um, and recognize the opportunity and, and just, you know, just read some articles every once in a while and, and do recognize that there are going to be jobs in this field down the road. So you don't have to be super fluent to get a job right now in this space. Um, and more and more jobs are going to exist. So as a young person, you're nervous about getting a job. I, if you have any sort of fluency or background in this space, there are so many companies that are looking to do anything connected to this. And if you just show a little bit of legwork, enthusiasm, and a little bit of knowledge, like your resume gets bumped up the list. So you don't have to be way into the Kool-Aid, but it's a supplemental skill that I think will serve you well uh, moving forward. Careers in blockchain.us. Careers in blockchain.us, <laughs> over 3,000 jobs right now. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan, Clev, and Bill for being on the panel with us. That was really fascinating. Thank you all so much for attending to the behind the scenes folks, too. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, we'll keep having this conversation. Thank you.